Hi there, my name is Victoria Bowler, and today we are talking again about classroom management in elementary general music. In the last video, we looked at some of the classroom management principles that we can keep in mind before we apply tools like sticker charts or other behavioral reward systems. So if you haven't watched that video yet, I do recommend that you just really quickly zoom through it before you watch this one, because it's going to really frame some of the practices that we'll look at here. Today, we're going to continue the classroom management conversation, but apply some really practical steps for redirecting behavior. We'll talk about some levels of redirection that we can use to prevent a lot of classroom management issues from starting in the first place. And I'll share some resources that I've used to frame my thinking around this topic in case you're interested in reading more. And again, just to reiterate, this is all outside of behavioral reward systems. Um, they're instead things that we can apply regardless of what classroom management strategy we choose to use. Okay, let's jump in. In the last video, we looked at some things that we can do to set our classroom management practices up for success. Most of this was before students even walked in the door, right? So those were things like making sure that we like our students and they like us, making sure that we are communicating in a way that is respectful, even as we redirect behavior. We talked about having developmentally appropriate expectations and the distinction between developmentally and situationally appropriate behavior. We also talked about how our lesson plans can partner with students' natural motivations so that our incentives for behavior and their actual behavior, so that we're all in alignment. But what happens when students actually walk into the classroom and we see that they are off task? In every single class, we can expect that students are going to push our boundaries. It's part of their job as kids, right? They need to explore, they need to test limits. Our job as the teacher is to be trustworthy and consistent as the classroom management leader. So when we establish a boundary, students can expect that we're going to follow through on that boundary. So to that end, here are some levels of redirection that we can expect to use in every single class. The key here is that we are focused on preventing disruptions as much as we possibly can. A lot of these tips came from an educational psychology class that I took in my undergrad, and I found those to be so incredibly practical, so incredibly helpful, um, and they made a really big impact on my teaching. So I share that here just to say that this sequence, the entirety of this sequence, is not one that I invented. When it comes to redirection, your attention as the teacher is incredibly valuable. Students really care about what you notice in the classroom. So the things that you notice and then the things that you comment on have a real weight to them. We can use this to our advantage by narrating the positive things that we see in the classroom before there's a behavior problem. And that's really key. We want to verbalize and direct our attention to the behaviors that meet our expectations. And we want to do that as soon as we possibly can as, and as often as we possibly can, right? Before we ever start redirecting. This works best as a proactive offensive strategy. Another thing to note about our narrations here is that it's really important to do this in a way that feels genuine and not sarcastic. So we want to avoid a sarcastic, really pointed like, oh, thank you so-and-so for being in rest position and then give a really obvious look to the kid who's not in rest position, right? <laughs> because we talked in the last video about sarcasm and communicating to students in a respectful, genuine way. So when we narrate, we are pointing out the specific behavior that we want everyone in the class to observe and imitate. Something like, I see kindergarten students sharing mallets, or I see second grade musicians who are walking, or I hear people using their singing voice. Again, your attention is the most valuable currency in the classroom. Narrating is a strategy that we are going to use every single class. Another strategy we'll use in every class is a nonverbal focus signal. This is something like um, putting your hand in the air or a thumbs up or a focus fox or something like that. You might also use finger symbols or maybe a chime. Regardless of what you decide to use, in every class we can have the expectation that students are going to need a prompt to focus back in. 
When we have this nonverbal signal, it lets us get attention for the whole class, the whole class's attention, without us yelling at the students. And like we talked about in the last video, if we do not think it would be appropriate for students to raise their voice and yell at us or yell at each other in our classroom, then it's a really good idea for us to model what we want them to do instead. These are the two foundational practices that we are going to put in place every single class. The first strategy is our attention, and then the next strategy is a nonverbal signal for when the classroom is getting a little squirrely. The reality is that these two steps are going to be enough for a lot of our students, but probably not all, and perhaps not every student for the entirety of the class, right? This goes back to having those appropriate expectations. When we notice a student who is off task, the first individual direction that we can give them redirection, because remember those first two apply to the whole entire class. As far as an individual redirection, the first step is just eye contact and a smile. The smile is important here, even if our first reaction feels like we want to look at them in a really stern way. Because remember in the last video, how much we talked about the importance of students liking us and us liking students and reminding ourselves of the human value in this relationship. We want to redirect behavior in a way that maintains a positive relationship as much as possible. Now, this doesn't mean that we change our expectations for student behavior, right? We're not lowering our standards because you'll remember that part of being a trustworthy adult in our students' lives is following through on the boundaries that we set, following through on what we say. So our goal is to have really high standards for behavior while we also have really high standards for our relationships. With this eye contact and a smile, the message we're sending to the student is that we are thrilled that they are in our classroom and we are aware of the current choice they are making. Educators call this with itness. That is like constantly scanning the room and being uh, super aware of every little thing that's going on. Students need to know that you see the choices that they make. This goes a really long way, especially if you can make a habit of utilizing it at a as a strategy at the very, very, very beginning of class. So eye contact and a smile. The next level of redirection that students might need is a respectful change in your proximity. So let's imagine that you've done your warm up routine and now you are in your first high concentration portion of your lesson and you have been narrating the positive things you see and you've been using your nonverbal communication, uh, but one student is consistently turning to their neighbor and making silly faces while the class is going on. First of all, this is pretty understandable, right? Because it's fun to be silly and it feels good to make people laugh. So you do your eye contact thing, but then you notice that the student starts the silly faces up again a few minutes later. The next step is for you to change your location to be closer to the student. This is especially easy if students are used to being used to you being up and around the room already. If there's not a single designated spot for the teacher area and a designated spot for the student area, students don't ever really know for sure where you're going to land next. And that means that there's not necessarily a back of the classroom area where students know that they won't be noticed by you as much. So walking around the room as much as possible can be uh, just one of the classroom management practices to have under our belt. An appropriate level of proximity is one where the student can sense that you are in their portion of the room, but you are not in their personal bubble. This is important to say, I do not recommend getting in a student's face and I definitely don't recommend like touching the student on the shoulder or making physical contact with them. What's convenient about this step is that if you have already made eye contact with a smile and if you are already in that student's portion of the room, then you are set up really well for the next step, which is a verbal redirection. This is even more convenient to do if the rest of the class is already occupied with a game or some sort of other activity. And when in doubt, a really quick activity is turn to your partner and tell them what we did last class, right? <laughs> Just something to occupy the rest of the class. This is another reason that having an active music room can lead to fewer classroom management problems as opposed to a passive music curriculum. So, 
Let's imagine that students are playing Bluebird Bluebird and you are up walking around the room and that makes it easy just to walk up to the student and give them a quick, quiet, verbal redirection. What we want to avoid here is constantly nagging at a student and calling them out in front of the whole class. And that might be something to mention here. Why are we not just calling this student out by name right off the bat in front of everyone? Why are we not just stopping class every time there's a behavior problem with this one individual student? Because a lot of teachers might feel like this would help their students learn their lesson, so to speak, um, and show everyone else in the class that if you don't want to be embarrassed, then you need to have better behavior. And I think that's a fair point, right? Fear and embarrassment are absolutely effective motivators. It just comes down to what strategies you want to employ and what your goals are. In my opinion, if we are constantly starting and stopping the lesson every time there is a behavior problem, that stop and go, the red light, green light version of this lesson really bogs down the learning process. It bogs down the rest of the class and it stops the whole class from learning when in reality you are just talking to one individual student. Right? So it doesn't serve the learning process for us to single out a student and stop teaching over and over and over. And it also doesn't serve our curriculum if that student is constantly spending time outside in the hallway or um, in a timeout area or something like that. Something else that can illustrate this approach is if you recall a time that you were chatty at a staff meeting and how you remember your principal handling it and how you would feel if your principal called you out so that you would be embarrassed and learn your lesson. Or maybe you remember being called out when you were a student in a way that you didn't really appreciate. I want to reiterate here that we should have really high expectations for student behavior. And when we redirect behavior, we want to do it in a way that maintains a positive relationship between us and the student and between the student and their peers, and between the student and the subject of music. That's really important. Okay, so like I said, these are the strategies that we can expect to use every single day to redirect student behavior before there's a really big behavior problem. I mentioned that a lot of these strategies are preventative, right? So they are appropriate to use in what we might consider to be kind of low grade behavior problems. Just to be clear, these are not appropriate strategies to use after a big behavior problem, like after um, a student throws a chair or tries to run out the room. Yes, these are strategies to focus on before a big emotional outburst and to work with students on the stories that they have around authority and self-management. Okay, classroom management is a really big topic and we have not even begun to start the conversation around all of the different situations you might find yourself in, in terms of a classroom management struggle. So here are some resources that you can use if you want to read more about this approach to classroom management. The first one is what every teacher needs to know. This is a K-5 series that's put out by the Responsive Classroom. This is a really practical look, a really practical deep dive at specific grade levels so that as we jump from, you know, K to fifth to first to third, right? As we jump through these different developmental stages throughout the day, we have some sort of guiding post <laughs> about what we can expect from each grade level. So very, very helpful just for setting expectations for what students will need from us. Next is punished by rewards, the trouble with gold stars, incentive plans, A's, praise, and other bribes by Alfie Cohn. I do not necessarily align with every single sentence in this book, but it has been very influential in my thinking about classroom management and uh, motivation in general. So this is something that I am sure you have heard of. It's very popular in like education and educational psychology circles and with good reason. So um, while I don't uh, it personally endorse every single sentence in the book, it is one that I recommend. And then my highest recommendation is a book called Teaching with Love and Logic. This is by Jim Fay and Charles Fay. 
This is the book that has framed my thinking about classroom management the most. And if you are looking for just one resource on classroom management, this is the one that I would recommend. Okay, today we have talked about several different levels of redirection that we can use in every single class. We've talked about ways to keep the classroom upbeat so that we have a positive relationship with students, so that students can maintain their positive relationship with their peers, and so that hopefully that student has a positive relationship with the subject of music. Like I said earlier, this is a huge topic and I recognize that we have barely skimmed the surface. So if you have any additional comments that you'd like to add, I would love to hear from you. You can drop your comment below. You can shoot me an email. I am Victoria at victoriabowler.com or you can find me on Instagram. I am at Victoria Bowler. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video.